Here we go. Here we go. Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much. I am Alana Odoms, Executive Director of the ACLU of Louisiana. Welcome, welcome everyone to the ACLU's Black Futures Series. Today, we are gathering to hear from an esteemed panel of leaders to collectively discuss the future of Black political impact. Where are we now and where we're going? We have a panel of diverse leaders today in two sessions. But before we begin, I want to introduce any newcomers here to the ACLU. The ACLU is a 101-year-old organization dedicated to protecting and defending the civil rights and civil liberties of all citizens. Basically, what that means is we slay in courts, in Congress, and in community. Today is a new day in our political environment. Black people have played a significant part of crafting the election results that we've seen, and there was an unprecedented political participation across America. And many of the leaders that are going to be speaking with us today had a significant role in making that happen. So let's meet them. Tanika Boyd, our very own, is the National Organizing Director and Deputy Political Director at ACLU's National Political Action Department, which we call MPAD. She is the former senior advisor at Color of Change PAC, and she was chief of staff there in that role. She is also the national director of Leaders of Color Initiative, where she recruited and trained Black and Latino people seeking public office. Welcome, Tanika. Thanks for having me. Crystal Cooper. Glad to have you, sis. Crystal Cooper is currently the director of communications for March for Our Lives an organization that harnesses the power of Gen Z to end gun violence in America and has ignited the highest percentage of youth voter turnout ever. She has served as communications advisor in New York City to Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration, and she led media strategy on gender equality issues for the ACLU, including the landmark marriage equality case before the United States Supreme Court Obergefell. Welcome, Crystal. And Lee, hey, Merritt. <laughs> Lee Merritt, uh, many of you know Lee, he is a dynamic and renowned civil rights attorney in this nation. He has represented the family of several high profile cases of victims of police violence and murder, including both of Jean, uh, Tatiana Jefferson, who were each murdered in their own homes by off duty and unidentified police officers. Uh, he has also represented the family of Ahmaud Arbery, who was killed while jogging. Lee is co-counsel to the family of George Floyd, and he is also the founder and director of Grassroots Law Project and Limitless Resources, which provides mental health resources for families who have experienced police violence. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. And finally, and last but certainly not least, the one and only Dashika Ruffin. The Sheikah has been at the forefront of some of our nation's most historic and consequential political campaigns. Now y'all listen to this lineup. Doug Jones for Senate, Ayanna Presley for Congress, Elizabeth Warren for President, Hillary Clinton for America, as well as Obama for America, and most recently delivering to us our first African-American uh, senator from the great state of Georgia. She was senior advisor to Raphael Warnock's Senate campaign. Girl, this is, <laughs> that is amazing. Dashika previously served as our very own Southern Regional Director for the ACLU's Campaign for Smart Justice, where she focused on voter enfranchisement in Florida for formerly incarcerated people and ending mass incarceration in Louisiana and across the South. Welcome, Dashnika. It's so good to be with my ACLU family again. Thank you. We're so happy to have you back. And um, we are, we're gonna kick this conversation off. We have three incredible dynamic ladies and a, and a fantastic gentleman, but we're gonna talk about the ladies for a second here. We have a new president. We have a new vice president first South Asian and black woman of color. We have 27 black women in Congress. We are, we're at a place, we're in a new dawn, a new day, to quote uh, from the infamous, uh, infamous song. But this didn't happen overnight. 
I want to talk specifically to the Sheikah and Crystal first. What are the things in your respective work that you believe got us to this incredible moment in our nation's history? Yeah, so Alana, you you hit the middle beat on the head when you're when you open. This moment didn't happen overnight, right? The electoral success that we're seeing in this country, especially in Georgia, was a harvest of decades of labor performed by organizers in their community, mostly black and black, uh, black and brown people. And so we're literally seeing the embodiment of the phrase when preparedness meets opportunity. For us in Georgia, this journey has expanded over five to six years. We knew the demographics of our state was changing rapidly. Thanks to the brilliance of people like the Stacey Abrams, um, we capitalized on those changes, right? And so even in defeat, we kept working, we kept expanding the electorate, we kept registering people to vote, we kept educating and turning them out. And so one thing I love to say is culture and strategy for breakfast, right? You can have the best PowerPoint, the best campaign plan, the best analysis, but if you can't move people, you're never going to be successful. And so we had to meet people where they are. We have to speak their language. And so the difference in this moment, it wasn't just about politics. We, you know, we literally met people where they were. People were legit fighting for their survival. Healthcare was on the ballot. Jobs like equality, healthcare, freedoms, all were on the ballot. And so we were connecting the power of the people's vote to the change they wanted to see. So it wasn't about rhetoric or, or, or just happenstance and pop and hamper stance. It was about real change, quantifiable change. We saw people and we met them where they were and they saw themselves in the process. And so when you can inspire people to dream and hope and, and just really be in the moment in their lowest moments, that's where the real power comes over. And so again, while we have some really great candidates this cycle, you know, I happen to work for one of them. Um, it wasn't about a Calvary coming to save us. We were that Calvary. We were taking back the power. We were taking back the power for our people, for our families, our communities. And I think that's the movement you saw across the country. And that's what got us to where we are. A hundred percent. So much of what you said um, resonates, Dashika, and I think um, was a component to what worked so well for March for Our Lives. So I'll take a little bit of a step back and say that um, what worked for us was really being grounded in the recognition that this election wasn't about the end or a victory. It was merely the beginning of a new era in which we'd hopefully have fewer limitations and greater possibilities. Um, so it was about shifting the landscape in our favor for the next four years. And something that you said was taking back that power. Um, from the communications perspective, we sought to give voice to this generational perspective where young people are not single issue voters, right? They're single vision voters. Um, that vision is of a peaceful, thriving, healthy, inclusive future. So we built coalition, I would say first with um, fellow youth um, focused and youth serving organizations. So those were our comrades at United We Dream, at the Sunrise Movement, Dream Defenders. Um, these are the issues and the challenges that are really shaping a generation and our generational identity. And from there, we just focused on building up our power. Um, when we're talking about Gen Z, we're talking about folks who are 18 to 25 years old, many of them first time voters and um, they didn't need to be convinced of their power. They just needed to be reassured of all of these wins that they had over the course of, you know, even the Trump era to show what they could do at the ballot box. So our signature um, election 2020 campaign was called Our Power. And it was all about translating the power of movements to power at the polls. Um, so many points, like I mentioned during the Trump presidency, um, the March for Our Lives um, march, the 2018 original march in Washington is one of them where youth demonstrated their power. Um, in the 2018 midterms, um, we flipped seats, we elected the squad. Um, that was kind of like a practice round for the general election. And then youth, of course, what we saw in summer 2020, um, took to the streets for a new revolution. Um, so it was all about channeling that power and getting folks out. And the last thing I'll mention is that it's kind of the thing that ties it all together that we felt was really success successful. Um, youth have a deep recognition 
um, of the role that historical role that movements have played um, in getting elected leaders to champion progressive policy. So our friends at the Sunrise Movement, for example, they put out an excellent mobilization video right before the election that drew the parallels between the moment we're in and the moment that Martin Luther King Jr. and civil rights leaders and folks were in in the 60s with you know, President Johnson. And um, the role of movement then and now is not merely to elect, but to create the political will um, where maybe there was none before to do things like pass some gun um, reform and legislation. So everything we did was in service of that real opportunity beyond November 3rd. And that's what folks were really excited to use their power towards. Crystal, that, that's so empowering. And so I want to ask Tanika and also bring Lee into the conversation. Um, we had so much to motivate us and catalyze that energy. How do we keep people as inspired, as focused, and as motivated without all of that kind of energy and noise to respond to? And how do we add to what's been built thus far? Tanika, I'll ask you first. Yeah, every day, I think as Black people, we are adding to the world as it should be, right? Like I grew up in community with Black folks, and I believe to whom much is given, much is required, and that it was our duty to build on our ancestors' legacy. And Black folks know that. There is no permanent enemy, no permanent ally. And so we are here, as Crystal said, for a vision of the future. It is not about representation alone or representation for representation's sake. We know that representation isn't power. Power is power. And so that is at the center of the story that we want to be able to tell our grandchildren. And that is the story that we want our grandchildren uh, to tell their grandchildren. So um, I think at the heart of it, Black folks know that there will be politicians that disappoint us. Um, there will be politicians that, that fall short. Um, but we are constantly keeping up that drumbeat because we believe that there is a better future. And we know that we're on borrowed time and it is our duty to keep up and to keep going. I think there is a little bit of fatigue though, right? Because we spent the past four years, obviously uh, before that, but really the past four years have been really challenging for a lot of us. Um, and there is kind of this moment of reprieve that we have, but I think it is just, it's, it's just central to movements and it's central to um, black folks and black movements to continue that drumbeat, to hold folks accountable and to keep marching towards the world as it should be. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I wonder if we could kick it over to Lee for a second and shift gears just for a minute and, and talk about, um, you know, in 2020, we saw such a seismic shift in the American consciousness. Um, Juneteenth was recognized for the first time in our nation's history, which is shocking and unbelievable. Um, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima finally got their retirement papers. They got their walking papers in 2020. Companies and colleges are being called out on racism and structural racism. The term Karen became a mainstream archetype um, and reparations is no, no longer a taboo concept. It also seems as though black people are starting to be believed, obviously, especially when there are cameras involved, involving police brutality. And we have some convictions, very few, but some convictions happening around police misconduct. We also have the Justice and Policing Act being taken seriously. So I wanna ask you directly, because you come directly from the front lines of this movement on police accountability and from a litigation perspective, what are we on the verge of changing and where do we need to be setting our sights for long systemic reform and police accountability? Well, I think it's important that we continue to track the families that, that brought us here. It, it was saying the names of people like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery that woke up the national consciousness. And, and it's, a, it's not enough to win a couple of elections or to see uh, just a bit of progress. We want, we want to see outcomes for the family of Breonna Taylor. We want to see convictions for George, um, for George Floyd and, and where the law does not uh, make that easy, uh, where qualified immunity blocks uh, civil accountability, where the federal government has its hands tied uh, due to our archaic laws in terms of accountability and where the Department of Justice and the federal government can reach, we need to see that change. And so there's some laws in the books that we're pursuing now, like the Justice 
Justice and, uh, in, in Policing Act or the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that you mentioned. Uh, but just like any corporation or any other business, when we try to, when we are pushing towards outcomes, it needs to be something that is specific measure and measurable. And so uh, with these specific families, we need to continue to push their cases to the forefront and ensure a just outcome. And where the law doesn't um, facilitate a just outcome, we need to change those specific laws. Um, and, and, uh, right now, we live in the deadliest police culture in the world. That's by the data that there's no other modern nation that kills or incarcerates more of its citizens. And that's something that we can address. We know that five out of eight people can go home from prison today without adding without uh, making our, our communities less safe. In fact, they make them stronger. Uh, and we know that there are officers, like the, the officer who murdered Tatiana Jefferson or George Floyd, who, who need to be held accountable in departments that need to be revamped. And as long as we tie our attention to the specific outcomes in that case, we'll be moving in the right direction. Absolutely, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're speaking about, um, you know, what we need to do as far as uh, systemic reform and how we need to go about, um, you know, involving people in the movement. And so I actually want to um, ask a question and I'm going to be kind of like singing the, the tune to the rest of development in my head while I'm saying it. And this is kind of open to everyone. But what can everyday people do? How do we bring everyday people into this tent and help them understand their power to be involved in movements for revolution, um, movements for black liberation, of course, police accountability as well. Lee, I'm happy for you to, to give a, a comment there and then I'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Well, as, as our leaders have said for so long since the 60s, it's, it always starts from the, gra the ground, grassroots up. And so these movements, although they're national, and it's great to see that the members of Congress are speaking on these issues and pursuing policies and legislation concerning the same. Um, it is it's also important that that we on a or oh, that we on a grassroots level um, participate in, for example, our, our local school boards uh, show up to our city council meetings, uh, uh, participate in jury duty. We won't see uh, significant outcomes until we activate people on a local level and know that, that that's that's year round. It's not just election time. It's not just, um, you know, during the presidential election, but that there are ways that you can get involved in your community, that there's a local chapter of the NAACP or Urban League or Until Freedom or Grassroots Law Project, that, that, that these are organizations that you can sign up for full time uh, to create change on a local level. And I think as, as we see more concrete change on a local level and more people involved um, with changes to our educational system, um, again, at the local level, then it'll spill over nationally. Well, let's add ACLU to that list. And I see Dashika wanting to jump in. <laughs> Go ahead, Dashika. <laughs> but no, I think Leah is exactly right, right? The real work starts in the off season. You don't wait until the election time, right? You do the work now. And so I, I think that you know, part of building power now it starts on the local level. You know, you don't wait for the presidential election cycle to, to kind of come in. And then also, it's not just about getting people elected, right? It's about holding them accountable. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times that I talk to people and it's like, people think the elected officials are like these mythical, you know, magical creatures that live in an ivory tower that you don't get elected and you never hear from again, right? Um, I have been blessed to be doing campaigns for over 20 years. Um, I know elected officials are pretty much every level of government and some are my family, right? But don't think for one moment that I won't call them or send a letter. I love sending them right a real good letter. I'm a letter writer. But, you know, it's about keeping people accountable. Um, I remember uh, on the Warnock campaign, um, I kept what we call the promise document, right? And it's a list of everything that he promised to do uh, during the election cycle. And so I don't know how many of you guys grew up with a black mama or a black uh, grandmother. And so what is universal in the black community, there is a phrase we have all heard at one point in time, I brought you in this world and I can take you out. And so I use that same concept in my voting power, right? Like I helped to get you elected. And if you no longer represent my needs and the community's needs and doing the people's business, I will help take you out. And so I think we just really need to like, it's not about just getting people elected. You don't build up your political power um, uh, willy-nilly, right? Like, you keep your necks on the people that, got, that you got elected, right? 
And so I think it's just continuing that effort, um, holding people accountable, and, and that work just continues on. Is there anybody else who wanted to jump in there? Yeah, I'll I can. It, Alana, if you don't, uh, go ahead. Either, either way works. Well, we'll take Tanika and then Crystal. Awesome. I was going to say, as an organizer, I just wanted to double down on on Lee and Dashika's point that this movement, um, these movements, have always been uh, led by everyday people. You know, John Lewis was an everyday person before he became a congressman. Rosa Parks was an everyday woman before she became the Rosa Parks. And so it's really antithetical to say that, you know, these, these movements aren't being led by everyday people, you know? Um, nothing moves without Black people. Nothing is cool, nothing is powerful, nothing is interesting without Black people. Beyonce don't get a number one album without Black folks. Long nails don't become trending without Black folks. And, and Joe Biden doesn't become president without the, without the great Black women um, across this country. And so um, that is the power that we hold. That is the power that we always envision. That is the power that we are trying to keep and to grow. And that is really, you know, on the backs of everyday people like my mother, who is a working class woman. She's probably at work right now in the factory. Um, she's going to be at, at church in two days uh, as an usher. Um, and right, like she's an everyday person, as everyday as an everyday person can be. She probably has a Michelle Obama toe bag and watching, watching Wolf Blitzer uh, in the evening. But things are moving because my mother and people like my mother get involved every day. She goes to Lee's point to see about the, the school board. She goes to figure out which judges, which decisions are being made because she has a son who's incarcerated. She is thinking about all the ways um, that a place like Milwaukee County franchises or disenfranchises her in all the myriad of ways. And so when we think about black political power, we think about the everyday person. We think about everyday black people who have always been the backbone of our movements. Oh, absolutely. And I, I'm thinking about your mother right now, Tanika, and you're exactly right. Everyday black men and women um, who really have been the perfectors of this democracy in so many, um, so many ways. Crystal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will just like to add on a little bit to what everyone was saying. And I think um, I work with young people, the young people say it all the time. So I will say it on their behalf, um, that, you know, Gen Z is not here to save you. And that the way they see it, if you have another 40 years left on this earth, another 30, another 15, then you need to be playing a role in building that future too. Um, and so I'm um, go back to something that Lee was saying about like the school board meetings and just being really involved in your community. When we look at the issue of gun violence in particular, this is such a localized issue. We've been waiting on the federal government to pass basic gun safety measures for decades. Um, and unfortunately, the more time that goes by and the deeper our political divisions become, ironically, uh, the more these solutions that seem like common sense um, just become harder and harder to pass despite widespread support. And we can't wait forever. So those communities who are most affected by gun violence, black and brown communities struggling with everyday gun violence, um, they're struggling with the kind of gun violence that an assault rifle ban or uni universal background checks won't necessarily solve. Um, and these are the communities that just straight up need resources. They need violence intervention funding, they need public school funding, they need stable, affordable housing. So these are the everyday struggles of folks. And so for people wanting to get involved, you know, do research on your city and state budget and share what you find and encourage others in your community to lobby those elected officials or keep keep uh, your foot on their necks about it and build power from the ground up from your living room. And I think I'm encouraged by the fact that I'm seeing, you know, just on my own social media timeline, so many movements modeling this DIY approach in this moment. And I think it's sending an important message to the everyday people that getting these big policy solutions passed is not a Washington centric conversation. It's about what's happening in Detroit, in LA, in Chicago, in Milwaukee, and what you can do about it. Absolutely. I, I want to talk about a specific um, policy issue that um, 
John Conyers has brought up over the last 40 years. You know, talking about being steadfast and having perseverance and not merely um, responding to the political climate of the moment. Um, let's talk about HR 40, and I wanna hear Tanika's voice on this specifically. Um, ACLU has, supports HR 40 in the formation of a commission that will study the effects of slavery and make recommendations to Congress on how we address those things. There was a hearing a couple of days ago, but people are still now just learning and acknowledging the effects of Jim Crow and slavery on our country. And we've had um, some of our most kind of um, um, thought provoking scholars and leaders kind of talk to us about these issues, Tana Hesse Coates, Nicole Hannah Jones. But what are people in your circle saying? And how do we actually start to have this conversation among um, a broader group of people so that we completely revolutionize this conversation? That is such a good question. Um, I think the first thing I'll say is I would be remiss to say uh, if I didn't say that people should join peoplepower.org, uh, which is our uh, site to to you know become more involved and engage in this work because as you stated ACLU is taking on uh, systemic equality and thinking through fair housing thinking through reparations thinking through how we close the racial wealth gap with a student debt relief thinking through just all the ways that um, these systems have disempowered black people um, and really have closed the middle class to so many black folks. Um, so that is one to make sure that folks get engaged. Um, I would say people, they clearly didn't grow up with my dad because my dad was standing on street corners with a bullhorn talking about reparations. Um, and for so long, it was a niche issue um, in black communities. Um, and, you know, we knew you were down if you had a stick, a bumper sticker on your car. Um, but we have to destigmatize reparations. We have to talk about it um, in rooms and ways so that people understand that this is, you know, this is about dismantling systemic equality. This is about making sure that uh, the dream and the promise of America is available and open to Black people. And that for well over 400 years, this country has uh, taken policies that have strategically uh, left Black people out. ta Coates blew the lid off with the Atlantic article when he talked about housing and he talked about how home ownership was really stripped from black people. And the idea of reparations at the core of it, at the heart of it, is about restoring what black folks um, were supposed to have um, and to make sure that black folks have access to all these systems that America continues to say is really the gateway to the middle class, but so many generations of black folks did not have access to that. So I think in order to make sure that so many people are kind of lumped in and understand um, what's at the core of it. We have to center the narratives of Black people. We have to center the narratives of working class Black women. We have to center the narratives of people who have multi-generation incarcerated. And so we have to talk about reparations as a recovery effort to Black people, um, as a debt owed, is not just about economic relief, but dismantling the systems so that um, we don't continue the next 400 years with this kind of level and layer of oppression that Black folks were under and are under. Absolutely. And just to take that even a step further to help folks recognize that um, systemic inequality is actually as harmful for our collective prosperity um, and even more so if we actually focus on um, creating equality and you know eliminating the wealth gap that actually has a power to lift everyone it's not the uh, you know lifting all boats and the, the smaller boats will rise but it is that we're missing out on huge areas of opportunity for prosperity because the wealth gap continues to be as wide as it is and because we've left an entire generation and community out of that prosperity. Um, so well put, Tanika. I wonder if anyone else had any thoughts on HR 40 and the advocacy around reparations. Lee? Yeah, I, I would just add, and, and again, it's just echoing what uh, our sister Boyd just said. We, we want to pull the conversation out, like acknowledge the history and the systemic oppression, but also understand the current impact that it has today that 
uh, following, you know, the the chattel slavery period, there was a brief reconstruction uh, era. Uh, and, and then our government, our government went about systemically finding ways to marginalize the black community. And that hasn't stopped. We have current policies on our books that you can draw a straight line from this from the plantations uh, to, to the mass incarceration. You can draw a straight line from the plantations to mass surveillance and the open air prison systems uh, in the communities that I grew up in, in Los Angeles, where we were redlined and where uh, we remain redlined in those communities. And so when people when people hear the word reparations, they shouldn't have to you know think back 100 years, 200 years, 400 years. They can think about uh, the, the largest prison industrial complex in the history of human uh, uh, of recorded history, I'm sorry, um, uh, that we currently live under, that this is a, that, that these are all symptoms of a, a, a system, systemically oppressive system that remains and that when we hear things like the war on drugs that is ongoing, that, that, that how that plays out through our criminal justice system is a war on black and brown people. Uh, and that it, when we, when we call for reparations, we're calling for not only um, payment, for the, the 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 labor of our ancestors, but freedom from from the oppression of our government that keeps us in in, um, um, in, in the same sort of hole that we started in. And I think it's you know we talk about those drawing those direct lines from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration to today. You know it is no surprise that the former. Um, slaveholding states of the Confederacy occupy the top 10 states in highest incarceration rates in the nation, but we don't think about it in that way. Um, also, this idea of the drained pool politics, the zero-sum game, there's a really beautiful book out right now by Heather McGee, where um, she documents um, a horrible massacre that happened in Louisiana, Colfax, Louisiana, where after Reconstruction, um, rioters came and burned down the courthouse and the seat of government in order to prevent uh, an African-American person who had been elected from holding that seat. And think about that direct correlation with what happened on January 6th and the fact that folks would be willing to burn down, to, to destroy, to defile the seat of our American democracy simply because we want to open up a multiracial and multi-ethnic democracy. That is what we have to remember. This is not new. This is all in our history. And so I wanna shift us to this conversation around divisiveness, right? Um, Joe Biden spoke about how corrosive racism is and we're gonna be putting forward the systemic equality platform to him to address um, hopefully what we're gonna call the final reconstruction, right? We don't want another reconstruction because that means this one didn't work just like the last one didn't work. But that also means uniting this country. 74 million people who had a different perspective, who saw a different side than what we're speaking about now. Somebody, anybody, please talk to me about reunification. Talk to me about how do we go forward as a, as a nation unified with a new idea around telling a full American history and a new American story. I mean, I, <laughs> that is such a tough question because, you know, I think before November, I would have this utopian, um, you know, answer, right? But like looking at the electoral map on election day on November, it was just clear of how many people were never going to be able to convince. I come from a state where, you know, I won't mention her name, but there are, are newly elected ultra-right congresswomen, you know, from middle Georgia there's a lot more people like her, right? And so like the previous occupant of the White House, he didn't create racism. He didn't create this divisiveness. He gave them cover and he emboldened them for them to come out of the shadows, right? And so while I think it is important to, to kind of work in a bipartisan manner, I think it's ultimately important. And that's what we saw in this electoral moment of making sure that you're covering the base for your base, right? You have to take care of home before you can even extend the arm or the olive branch. And so I think, you know, when we're talking about this political power, um, really making sure that your agenda represents the people that you are representing, right? And that's what brings people into the fold. Um, I, as a kid, my, my, my mom, which is my grandmother for all the people who did not grow up in the country, 
told me that, you know what, everyone is not for you and you are not for everyone. And it doesn't make it, it, it's not that it's anything wrong. It just means that everyone is not going to understand where you are, right? So if you continue in the mode that you are, you, you extend that olive branch, you have real open conversations. We were talking about repara uh, reparations, right? And I wanted to mention this. We are not even at a point where we can actually have an honest conversation. HR 40 is not creating reparations, it's creating study. We haven't even got to the point of the study, right? And so while we can talk utopian, I, I'm, the, I'm probably the most optimistic person you will ever meet, it is about making sure that you are taking care of your base first and then extending the olive branch. And so, yes, walk, work across the aisle, um, uh, work in bipartisan manners, but you can't force someone to believe in your existence. You can't force someone to believe that you um, deserve you know, basic fundamental rights, right? And so taking care of your base first is important to me. Absolutely. Tanika? Yeah, I'll jump in here quickly and say, um, this is where white allyship goes to work. Um, because this is in my ministry. Um, this is in my work uh, to patchwork folks who were very content by the millions uh, with dismantling every civil right that I had and my grandparents had. But this is really the work of the allies to go get their folks, to have conversations at the Thanksgiving table, to talk in depth, to go through these trainings, to get in community with marginalized groups, get some training um, and go get their people. Uh, because this isn't necessarily our work. I don't believe that marginalized people, specifically Black people, um, even more specific, Black queer people, um, should, should be in harm's way to build a different America. Um, we have paid that debt in full. We don't owe any more. Uh, but this is the work of the folks who said, especially during the summer, that they were gonna lock arms, the allies, I need them to go with their people. Absolutely. Do you mind if I just jump in? Yes, um, please, absolutely. Come on, was, come on, sis, come through. There's something that Dashika said that I'm like, I'm so glad you said it first because I didn't wanna be the one out the gate to say it. But when I hear this question, my follow-up, like the follow-up question that comes to mind is who are we considering when we're talking about unity and unifying? Um, Particularly because, like you said, Dashika, I'm worried about keeping that broad coalition that helped get Biden elected together, because even that is holding on by a thread. And the only pathway to do that is to deliver some real wins and some tangible improvements to the people who made it possible. That's how we build the momentum and hold this coalition together. If we end up in gridlock over things that should be common sense, like honestly centric policies, because you said we can't even get to reparations, long overdue policies like gun control, which a majority of Americans support, like raising the minimum wage, this coalition is gonna fissure and crumble. And when we look at like young people, black people, we were the ones who were messaged to about this election, that this was a once in a lifetime election, that this, the, the circumstances and the conditions that led to 2020 might not happen again. Um, and so we were put in this position where it was up to us to save democracy. And if the stakes are lower next time, you know, or if we don't see any bold action or any tangible change on the community level, um, that all but guarantees the collapse of our coalition. Um, so the only way to get through the dis this divisiveness is with a focus on delivering the real wins for the people and the communities who got us here, knowing that, knowing that it's going to impact in a positive way the folks beyond our coalition as well, right? It's gonna, it's going to positively impact um, some of the folks who at least voted for Trump. I don't know about, I can't speak for the people who showed up at the Capitol riot, but um, you know, these these wins will benefit all, and we have to focus on those. Crystal, I am so glad that you're talking about um, the impact of Gen Z. So I have a question specifically for you about this age demographic of 18 to 25. We know that young people have always been at the forefront of changing history and leading movements for social change, not just nationally, but also globally. Um, 
Can you talk about what role you find? And we already know you said Gen Z feels like, look, we're not here to save you. But talk about what what role they do have or they do believe they inherit in this new space. And let's talk about midterms. Let's talk about 2024. We know that while this was the election of our lifetime, it's likely that we might end up in 2024 in a circumstance with a person who might not have the same um, overt um, dog whistle um, racism and, and, and policy that we saw from a previous administration, but there may be more subtle nuance, uh, you know, racism and things of that nature that can be easily, easily um, m- misunderstood or confused. And so, Talk to me about the role of Gen Z and how we continue to uh, allow this group to to lead this movement. A hundred percent. I'm I consider myself very lucky to kind of interact with and consider Gen Z. Um, you know, my my peers and colleagues day to day. There are a couple of things I'm seeing uh, that provide some insight. I think as to how this may play out. Um, and you have to remember that they have come up politically in a time where there feels like this huge vacuum of real leadership and ownership and you know clear-eyed vision about a way forward so one of the most significant things i'm just seeing them do in general is to model the changes that they want to see from their government rather than waiting on government to come up with a solution um i'm sure you know we're just coming off of you know texas recovering from the storm where we saw a lot of mutual aid resources shared and i think that mutual aid programs in general are a really excellent example of this because through these networks young people are providing this safety net that they expect the government to provide um they're showing what it means and what it looks like to shift resources to support urgent needs of the most vulnerable populations um, and so when we think about even the, you know, the movement to defund the police and invest in community, the mutual aid work that they're doing throughout the country, um, you know, at this widespread level and hyper local level is already the blueprint for taking that approach at scale, you know, put money that is in excess and not serving a purpose into, um, you know, this, this space where it can actually make an improvement in people's lives. Um, And I think like ultimately they're tired of playing the game of politics. You know, they're not counting tallies and keeping score. They want to see these wins in communities, not just on paper. Um, And also the thing that gives me hope is that they really want to see a compassionate government. Um, I think even through mutual aid, like they model a very profound love for humans and people. um, And they're really invested in creating that idea of a beloved community that, you know, Martin Luther King so famously discussed where people can thrive, even at a gun, you know, even at a gun violence prevention organization, they see that as being the key to this like future where people don't decide to pick up a gun to solve their problems, right? Um, And then I guess like on the specific kind of electoral level, um, I think one thing that's really exciting to see is young people in Gen Z looking to impacted people as experts and leaders. Um, for them, authentic representation is the impacted leading um, and gaining power. And you know, we're seeing that shift and like modeling that shift internally at March for Our Lives. Um, when we think about gun violence prevention, we're really lucky to have a champion in Congresswoman uh, Lucy McBeth of Georgia, um, who lost her son to gun violence and it's a different dynamic. It's a fundamentally different dynamic than electing some sort of, you know, well-off, well-connected statesman, you know, to model the, to model and like um, voice the concerns of constituents that they themselves can't really relate to. Um, And I would say that it's really, it's really impressive to see those changes manifest so quickly because I feel like it's really started to happen in like the last two or three years. I hope folks were um, or had their notebooks and was taking down notes because Crystal just dropped some real some real wisdom on us. Um, Lee, I want to um, raise up that we'll be kind of sharing this video out long after this uh, this particular time. But what's going on in Texas right now is a crisis, and you know we heard Crystal speak about mutual aid and about young people driving change um, in community where it feels and seems and the actual reality is that government has actually failed them. 
And so can you share with us what your experience is like on the ground right now in Texas? And I know you're actually multitasking right now and trying to serve the community at the same time. That just goes to show what kind of, you know, the integrated approach that we even talk about here at the ACLU of how, you know, how you how you lift up community and, and, and do all these things at the same time. Um, but talk to us a little bit about what's happening on the ground there and how um, mutual aid and, and other community folks are kind of stepping in and, and filling that breach. Texas is dealing with a natural disaster, right? One caused by inclement weather. Uh, but the crisis is one of failure of government. The crisis is, is, is directly tied to greed um, and power being hoarded by the few. Uh, Texas is one of the few, actually the only states with an independent power grid that they refuse to update because they don't like federal regulations because they feel like it will impact their bottom line. Uh, what, what we're going through in Texas with power outages all over, all over the state, uh, with people being um, literally freezing to death, people um, being denied food, people um, lacking shelter, uh, is something that was both foreseeable and that it deserves a, a, an appropriate response from our leadership. But unfortunately, we're dealing with an archaic style leadership that thinks, well, Texas has the ninth largest economy in the world. Texas is the largest energy producing state in the country and one of the largest en energy producers in the world. And so for corporations and the haves, they're fine. And the have not to left to fend for themselves. And so I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting now uh, from um, uh, because I'm outside of my home, like many Texas residents, um, due to uh, the 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 effects of this this again uh, crisis of leadership and natural disaster. And I believe the answer is exactly what we're talking about here today. From a ground level, we need to replace the leadership structure in, in Texas that it has left the people of Texas to fend for themselves. Uh, and this goes directly to people like Senator Ted Cruz, who went on vacation as opposed to meet the immediate crisis. While, while people on the ground level, you can see who, you're le who the real leaders are because they're out, they're, they're out in the streets handing out bottles of water, uh, coordinating food relief, providing shelter, in fighting for uh, the people of Texas. Those are the people that we need to be electing in the office. Georgia gave us a great example when they, when they turn, turned Texas not blue, but they turned it black. Um, le leaders uh, in Texas organized and galvanized people on the ground level to take over the state and rescue democracy. Uh, but they also gave us a framework for what to do in Louisiana and what to do in Texas and what to do in Oklahoma and, and the other um, there, there's a new Southern strategy that, jo that Georgia laid out for us that I think we, we should all, we can all take advantage of. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I just want to just lift up and, you know, just take a moment to recognize how many people are displaced right now, how many people are experiencing um, tremendous trauma. And, um, you know, it's, this is something that um, we in Louisiana have a lot of experience with. Unfortunately, um, we've seen many natural disasters that have been compounded and exacerbated by a failed, uh, you know, government response at the state, local, and the federal level, and have had a lot of opportunity, a lot of suffering, and a lot of loss of life. Um, and I just want to, you know, kind of double click on this point that um, holding leadership accountable, right, and how you actually respond in crisis, and you know, we know that character comes out not in the best of times, but what are you doing in the worst of times? How are you showing up and how are you, how are you leading in times and moments of crises? And we can see clearly that there are responses that um, I think any person of, of reasonableness would say are not appropriate in this kind of situation with such a traumatic um, and devastating loss of life and resources. So I wanna thank you for even being with us today taking the time, being away from your family. And, and, you know, it just goes to show how important and what your commitment is to making sure that you are, um, you know, really representing. And so we're really grateful for that. Um, I want to just um, kind of shift us just a little bit to talk about, um, you know, what we're going to do going forward. And so let's imagine over the next four years, we're building our movement up. We're having wins. We're um, rolling back some of these really um, um, 
unconstitutional policies that that have been enacted over over many many years we're creating strategic coalitions that really work and now it's 2024 what did we accomplish over these four years what are we advocating for now so if in a best case scenario what have we achieved what are some of those 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 highlights that we're touting and saying we were actually able to for example deal with or, or or create a pathway to citizenship for for folks and, and immigrants. We were really able to start looking at real resolution and opportunity in ending mass incarceration. I'm just throwing some things out here, but in your heart and in your um, in your spirit and in your line of work, what are these things that we're constantly reaching for and what do you think we can accomplish over these next four years? And I'm opening it up to the whole team. I can uh, I believe that we can say Oh, go ahead, Lee. No, Ms. Boyd, please, after you. We'll have Tanika first. Great, a, a thank seven you. Gentleman, a seven gentleman. Well, thank you. Um, I, was going to say, I mean, we are going to be laying the groundwork for the world as it should be, right? And the world as it should be, uh, we should be restoring voting rights. We know locally that so many legislators are trying to take on, uh, especially in places like Georgia, to uh, further disenfranchise people, reduce some of the conveniences that should have been rights that we saw during uh, the pandemic. And so in four years, we wanna make sure that we have sound and firm voting rights. We wanna make sure that we're restoring the Voting Rights Act. We wanna make sure that we are expanding fair housing. Fair housing has been critical and crucial for black folks, working class black people across this country we want to make sure that we put a, 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 a indent in this debt and student loan debt. We have a student debt crisis in this country. Uh, black women, working class black women who bear the burden of teaching jobs, who bear the burden of social work, who bear the burden of really uh, the professionals who are keeping our communities together, not just our communities, but the wider America together. We want to make sure that we are we are making sure that they don't have to be straddled by all this student loan debt. So we wanna see a, a significant reduction in that student loan debt uh, moving forward. We wanna make sure that we've done something to ensure that the post office has the funding and the capacity uh, to, to you know make sure that people who are incarcerated get their letters, to make sure that during the midterms, folks can get their ballots. So we wanna restore the post office. And then the last thing I'll say, um, this year is going to be the 50th anniversary of the war on drugs. Uh, we know that so many black men and so many black women are incarcerated because of uh, unjust sentencing, because of all the ways that the drug laws played out when I was growing up um, in the 80s and in the 90s across this country. And so we wanna see people granted mass clemency we wanna make sure that mothers are at home with their children. We wanna make sure that fathers who are now grandfathers are at home with their kids. And we wanna see a drastic reduction in incarceration in the next four years. A great place, great place for me to pick up on. Uh, I used to teach a, a, a class in, in Atlanta as a, um, a teacher at South Carolina High School School of Law and Social Justice. And we talked about grassroots organizing in our first, the first, we, we came up with three A's as a strategy for, for organizing. The first was awareness. You had to get people aware of what was going on, familiar with the problem, intimately familiar with it so that they can speak about it intelligently and from an informed basis start to uh, come up with solutions. And I think in the past four years, uh, the awareness piece has set in. People are aware of, of, of the massive problems that we have with our militarized policing, that we spend, uh, um, you know, the bulk of our, but our our local municipal budgets on an ineffective and militarized policing that does not make us safer. People are aware of it now. Uh, the second part uh, of the 3A system was aware, affronted, the last one was active. Affronted was something that we saw. People were upset about it and they took it personally. So it's it's one thing to understand it, but to take it personally and see how it impacts you and your neighbors. And when you're, you're when you're truly affronted about something, you cannot let it let it go on. And so I think in the past four years we've taken care of the first two A's, uh, but the last A, the active part, I think is is what what lies in front of us. In the next four years, I think that we can send five out of eight people in prison home. Uh, our, our our 
the, our awareness piece has has sort of let us all know that um, um, from this prison industrial complex, we we criminalize poverty and sickness in a way that is is inhumane, and, and our prison system, uh, as it currently stands, represents a human rights crisis that that needs immediate action. Send uh, the people that that you know the Biden administration and, the, and others have acknowledged were wrongfully incarcerated or uh, disproportionately incarcerated when it as it relates to uh, um, their actual crimes or their activity, um, uh, that, that there are clear disparities between how black people are treated in, in our court system, how white people are treated. Uh, those people are not only figurative people, they exist in a jail, my father being one of them, who is incarcerated today uh, for possession of a, a, a low level quantity of drugs. Uh, now it's time to get active, sending those people home, and not only sending them home, but giving them the resources to rebuild their to rebuild their communities. I believe that it's time to return power to people um, to figure out public safety or reimagine public safety on a local level. And I believe all, all of those things, in terms of what we do with all of this knowledge and all this energy that that has sprung up in the past four years to build actual solutions, is what we have in front of us. I feel like everybody's voice should be um, should be lifted up on this topic. So I'm going to come to you, Jashika. So you know, I, I'm listening to everyone speak, and I'm kind of closing my eyes and just reimagining justice, right? And so, if we accomplish everything that was spoken about uh, from Tanika and we, we're still scratching the surface, right? Everything that we that we have been talking about is still rectifying the 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 harms of the past, right? The racial inequalities, um, uh, the, the extreme racism, the structural, structural racism, we're still starting as a deficit. And so um, I'm glad Tanika mentioned clemency. Like that's something actually President Biden can do tomorrow, right? With a stroke of, pen, of a pen, he can dramatically reduce the federal prison um, uh, population. And so I know uh, the ACLU is, is part of that movement, part of that drumbeat of, uh, pressuring Biden to, to use his presidential pardoning um, powers, right? Um, so the, that's what we talk about, like the accountability and the movement, keeping that energy up. Um, with the mass incarceration, I find, I hope we finally get to the point where we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? Implementing real uh, sustainable measures that will really reduce the jail and prison population in this country, like mandatory minimums, right? Ending truth and sentencing provisions, instead of just focusing on, which are great, uh, ending cash bail and ban the box, but those are, those are pre, those don't get to the heart of uh, the jail and prison population in this country, right? And so we need to tackle those harder um, provisions, those measure, measures that, don't always feel good, right? It's hard to create a narrative um, that you can wrap in a nice tiny box around um, mandatory minimums and, and truth and sentencing provisions, right? Um, felony murder, things like that, the, the harder things to kind of to, to digest, right? So I hope we really get to, into a habit of having real conversations in 20, um, by 2024 so we can really affect substantial um, and systematic changes. Um, you know, I also think about in this country, you know, we love to say that we're running the same race, right? We're not, right? If 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 my lane has a hurdle um, and my shoe is untied and I have holes in my shoes, right? Like we might start at the same point, but we're not going to run the same race. And so really having those real conversations, um, you know, I give a lot of homage to uh, the great Jeff Robinson, right? You know, he talks about having those conversations. He ran around the country having those conversations. Um, so just... Right. So getting into a place where it's like, it's okay to have the uncomfortable conversations. Um, if we're sitting in rooms like this and always comfortable and having these cozy conversations, what change are we really affecting? And so that's what I really hope we get into in 2024. I mean, I will be honest with you. We have a very short um, runway. Uh, you know, we talked about 2024, the elections just happened. We have roughly 18 months to really get this right and make some real um, substantial changes because right now our side, um, and I guess whatever side you want to, you know, consider the more progressive side has a supermajority in Congress, right? And so we shouldn't be coming into these positions as um, 
already in a position of compromise, right? We need to go big. We need to be bold, right? And we have the opportunity to do so, right? So we can't get to 2024 if we're not even there in 2022. So I just hope that um, we really start having those real conversations that will lead us into victory in 2024. Cool. So we're going to hear from Crystal. And then because we're on our last couple of minutes, I want to ask everyone in just one or two sentences what folks who are listening in the audience can do to help support. But Crystal, I'll give you the last word on this conversation of what we will have accomplished in 2024 if everything goes well. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I want to see every single thing uh, that my fellow panelists said come to fruition. I really, I really do, right? And to pick up on what you were saying, Dashika, about like getting to the nitty gritty, um, I feel like when we, when we have truly done that, we will be in a place where we're no longer begging to be invested in. We're no longer having to beg and yell that our lives have value and are worth the investment um, and are contributing something to society because you have to fundamentally believe that um, in order to, to have the conversations that are less comfortable and more um, in the weeds. Um, so I, you know, I'm hoping that that's a place that we can get to because even when I'm thinking about young people, um, they're full of hope for a time, right? But people, you can't have your spirit kind of beat out of you. And it does take a toll when you have to constantly just focus on like um, the big broad, like I'm a person, <laughs> like let's pass the legislation that even, you know, saves my life. I mean, just to focus on gun violence quickly, you know, 40,000 people per year die by guns and that is an epidemic. Um, and we have to make a dent in that or else we're going to let a generation of predominantly young uh, black men and women, um, you know, slip by. Um, and that does require that pivot that you were saying to Sheikha, like, yeah, I hope we do get an assault um, rifle ban passed while we have this super majority. It's like the only window of opportunity to do it for like the next, you know, uh, 15 years. I hope that happens. But I also hope that we can talk about it at a level that's a real human conversation level and is not this like, gun violence prevention campaign that that is constantly happening where we're talking about all those other forces that fuel gun violence in our country and we're talking about um you know gun glorification and the access to guns and we're talking about um you know all of these things in um community that force people like i said to pick up guns we have to be able to um get to those conversations in order um for us to make real progress but i hope that when we do I hope that when we do, um, that Gen Z will be in a position in 2024 um, to run for the offices that they're qualified for, right? Um, that they will at that point be thought of um, as current leaders and not just rising or future leaders, because hopefully they will have been, you know, part of um, these rooms to make these changes happen. That's absolutely right. And I hope we actually get a study committee to actually study gun violence as a health and public health epidemic. If we don't actually study it, we know that's the reason why if we can't get to studying the issue, what we can't, we cannot solve what we do not diagnose. So amen on that crystal. And just so in our closing, I wanna hear everyone's voice. If, if you can do it in a word, boom, beautiful. If you can do it in two or three words, great. I will kind of kick us off what you can do, donate, whether it's to mutual aid, whether it's to your um, Black-led organization of choice, whether it's to the ACLU, um, donate. Dashika. Relational organizing. Have conversations with the people you know, right? Any, it, it doesn't take a degree to do that. Everyone knows people, you, you know, your family, your, your, your community, your church um, community. Have those important conversations. Education is key. So I just really believe in community, uh, relational organizing organizing. Tanika. Yeah, I agree with Dashika. Re relational, or we're organizers, you know? Uh, you have to get into community. You have to get into institutions. Allow yourself to fall in love with an issue. If it moves your heart, let it move your feet or move your hands. Um, and please join peoplepower.org and we will get you uh, towards some action. We'll get you. Look, we got a job for you. If you want one, you got a job for you. <gasps> Lee. Grassrootslaw.org. I echo everything that Tashika and Tanika and even you said, but uh, grassrootslaw.org is how you can connect directly with some of the work that, that, that I'm, I'm directly connected to. 
Thank you. And Crystal, final word. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I would say research and amplify. This goes back to the point that every single person every day has a role to play in making this change. And we won't know about it. We like the major organizations and movements only have but so much capacity. We want to support with the money and resources that we have. But bring these gaps to our attention, you know, post about it and then talk about it, right? Like get it shared within your community um, so that we can do something about it. And um, if you want to, you know, follow more on the gun violence prevention movement and everything that we'll be up to at March for Our Lives to kind of address political apathy, corruption and get something done on guns, um, you can text CHANGE to 954-954. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I could continue this conversation for hours with these leaders. You all have heard from, uh, I think folks who are going to be changing our national landscape, watch out for these leaders. These are the change makers of our society and you too are change makers. And so let us all join in this movement together. I want you to stay, uh, stay tuned though. Although we're wrapping this conversation, there is a fantastic panel that will follow us. It will come to you by 4.30. Um, but I want to thank these incredible guests. I want to say thank you to Crystal. Thank you to Sheikha. Thank you, Lee. And thank you, Tanika. We will be cheering you on and following you and supporting you. And happy Black History Month, everyone. Happy Black History Month. Yes. Thank you so much. Happy Black you Futures care. Month. Amen. Black Futures, Black History, and all things Blackity Black. <laughs> Great, and welcome to part two of the future of Black political impact. My name is Christopher Bruce. I'm the political director for the ACLU of Georgia. We hope you have enjoyed part one. It was great, wasn't it? And if you are just joining us, it's okay. We have another packed discussion with incredible leaders with years of pivotal work as organizers, activists, and community builders. We're gonna be talking about how we see the work ahead and what's possible in our respective communities. So let's start with introductions. Gentlemen, you're all great, but I'm gonna speed through these because I wanna get right to the questions. Yusuf is currently a senior strategist at Racial Justice in the New York Civil Liberties Union. He's previously served as the director of the Central New York chapter from 2015 to November of 2020, where he led advocacy and coalitions against police misconduct, surveillance, and juvenile solitary. He's also an adjunct professor um, at the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University. Next, we have Gary coming up, who's a social justice advocate, community organizer, and champion for systemic change, something that we all need at this day and time. He's the co-founder of the media outlet, The Rouge Collection, featured in Wired Magazine, The New York Times, CNN, Morning Joe, and of course, Rolling Martin Unfiltered. Lewis is a campaign strategist of the Justice Division for the ACLU and Impact. So in 2018, Lewis ran for city council in Austin, Texas, and became the first formerly incarcerated person in Texas to have their name on an electoral ballot, definitely making history right now as we talk about Black History Month. Lewis is also the author of three books. And last but not least, Brandon Tucker, who's the policy director for the ACLU of Tennessee. He's a former state strategist at the ACLU National, former lobbyist and electoral organizer, served as political coordinator for the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. And he's also a former organizer for the Service Employees International Union. So brothers, welcome. Thank you so much for being here on this Friday. We're gonna continue what happened in the past uh, selection and get right into these questions, which is starting off with the case for prioritizing Black political impact on a regional level. And I would love to say as political director of the ACLU of Georgia, when it comes to prioritizing black political impact, we know what happened in Georgia this last electoral section, uh, electoral cycle. And we know what's gonna happen in the next ones. And a lot of it had to deal with black impact. Why does it matter? And what are some examples of successful local or regional engagement? And what can we do to proactively now given that especially now that there isn't as much to constantly react to 
on a national level. Yusuf, how about we kick it off with you? Thank you very much, Chris. You know, honestly, uh, that question was really masterfully answered by the last panel, and it just, I just was floored with, with the a great work that they've done to make sure we center the fact that we have to make sure that this isn't just a one-off type of scenario, right? That we are making sure that we are going to where directly impacted communities are, that we are mobilizing those who are directly impacted. And because we're speaking about Black futures, it's really important for us to be explicit to talk to the breadth of Black communities. You know, we can't just show up in a transactional sense and say, we need your votes and then disappear. This is about the long-term realization of the challenges that Black communities face. And what I think is most important to center in that perspective is, is how essential it is, right, for, for us to, to, to go beyond voter registration and, and voter engagement, but also accountability once elections are done. Because it's not enough to just get great people in office who are amazing and lovely and care about our issues. It's about once they're in office, are they making sure that they do the communities well? And I know we'll get some time to talk about that later, but I, I think to me that, that's one of the first steps is holding folks accountable, reminding them that indeed they are public servants and the operative and more explicit part of that phrase is the service part that often gets forgotten. Gary, why don't we bring you into the conversation? Any thoughts? So I, I think Yousef uh, hit, hit the nail on the head. One, you know, I've been a part of a host of different issues here in the Baton Rouge area uh, and in Louisiana advocating for uh, racial justice, equity in contracts and procurement, uh, access to health care. Uh, we can focus on, you know, what's happening in D.C., but all politics is local. Uh, and the impact of our advocacy is felt the most on the ground uh, where people are. And so when we talk about having a community or a regional strategy, it's important that you know who your elected officials are. It's important that not only that you know who they are, but they know who you are and they know what you're fighting for. Uh, most folks know me because of this viral video with County, uh, but one of the things that can be highlighted from that is I know the name of every member of the school board. I know every state representative in our community, but not just that I know them, they know who I am because I'm consistently showing up. Um, and I think that one of the things that is uh, paramount is that we be consistent in our advocacy, right? Uh, the reason Georgia flipped blue is because of years of consistently organizing around voter mobilization and voter turnout years of input uh, to make those things happen. Government is a ship, business is a speedboat. In business, you can pivot and turn things uh, at the drop of a dime. Government takes process and procedure in order to change it. And in order for us to be effective at changing it, we've got to be committed to the process. Well, Gary, it's funny that you say that you've gone viral because you have. In fact, everyone on this panel has gone, pow gone viral because they've spoken truth to power. Um, how do you leverage that? in moments to accomplish the goal of making significant change? And how do we take that attention and convert it into action among people? Gary, you're talking about the South. I love the South. Why don't we talk to you? So, you know, I've been pushing this whole concept of a new Black South for years. Uh, and 34% of Louisiana's Black. Mississippi is the only state that's Blacker than Louisiana. But we don't have a single Black person uh, elected statewide. When we talk about how have I leveraged this platform, it is to spread those type of messages to larger audiences of people so that we can create the change that we're looking to create in communities. Uh, the beauty of the county moment is it just opened doors uh, that as an advocate in my community just did not exist for us to be able to have these kind The fact that I'm here with you at the ACLU uh, having this conversation was not something that uh, would have happened for me a year ago. No matter how effective we've been at advocacy or getting things done, the platform just isn't there. And so I think the greatest thing uh, about having one of those moments is the ability to, to continue to amplify the work. I'm telling you, there's a Gary Chambers or a Yousef in every community in America. The difference is they just haven't gone viral yet. Their, their stories just aren't out there yet. Uh, but there are people on the grassroots level fighting to make change happen. And it's important for those of us who have uh, a bigger platform to look back and find those voices and help amplify them because that's how we connect this work. And when we begin to connect this work, I think the change is easy to happen. 
And I agree with you because we, we do have those individuals out there who are using their platforms like Yusuf. Yusuf, could you uh, bring into the conversation? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because Gary and I were, were mentioned as like the top five speeches of 2020 or something like that. And it, it, it's, it's, I think he, myself, and perhaps the others who were mentioned and, and, and who have gone viral throughout the, the, the devastation that we saw from a global pandemic that disproportionately affected black people from uh, a, a, a crisis of a, a economic crisis that was induced by a pandemic that adversely affected black people to the consistent problems in our criminal legal and policing systems that continuously result in the death of black men and black women and black, black trans women um, and the disproportionality in the responses. It, it, it is important that we were able to go viral to help elevate some of these issues. But I think Gary said it right when he said there are plenty of people in our communities. What it has done, right, for, for me and my community in Syracuse, where I live, concretely, is it helped to demystify this idea that the only challenges of race are a Southern problem. That this is in fact a Northern problem as well. That in fact, in the progressive state of New York, we have in the city of Syracuse, the highest concentration poverty amongst Blacks and Latinos in the country. The ninth most segregated county is Onondaga County in the country. And what we've been able to do is to maximize the attention that those viral moments have garnered to begin to build political power in our communities, to demonstrate that this is what democracy looks like, to make sure that we're not going to request or inquire or ask or bequeath, but we're going to make demands and we're expecting our elected officials to show up or we're gonna have to show out. And quite frankly, what I think this really does is it forces the narrative and the conversations even at the local media level to shift because everyone in the country talked about Gary's video or my video or others' videos, except the local papers who are also complicit in fomenting the ability to continue oppressive actions against black people. And so I think what this has done is not just mobilize and organize people, clarify what the actual message and problem is and to amplify other people. And the last thing I'll say, cause I talk a lot, um, is it's really important that like the other people who also are in these moments that we share the light with them. And I, and I think that's the part, people like Twiggy Billu, people like Queen Alice in Syracuse, people like TJ Davis in, in, in Syracuse, organizers who, whose names will be recognized and who may not be recognized, but who are day in and day out showing up to make sure that we're demanding action for the issues that mostly affect us. You're, you're using your platform and you're making impact and change. Um, especially on situations, and I'm pivoting to our next question. Um, in four days, it would have been a year since an innocent black man jogging, Ahmaud Aubrey, uh, was murdered by armed residents for what we attribute to racism. Georgia just passed a hate crimes bill and is looking to pass a citizen's arrest statute this year to address this horrific act. Now, nothing's gonna bring this black man back to his family, but, these are the type of systemic changes that we're looking for, uh, but we also need more. We know that every organization has a lane. Some tend to have more resources than others, but it doesn't necessarily mean the impact is any less and a larger org may not be as nimble. So how do you, when a large organization, do a better job of service to the community and gain trust for the future? Brandon Tucker, I wanna to go to you with this one. Yeah, I look at this question in a couple of ways. One, has the larger organization actually made a commitment to do a better job of service to the community? Like, that's an important thing to, to recognize. Has the organization established that gaining trust is something that actually matters to them? Um, because if the answers to those questions are yes, we also need to have an investment conversation as well. And, but in our case, uh, where I'm at, at the ACLU of Tennessee, it, th we have affirmatively answered those questions as yes, and it becomes for me, uh, becomes about, for me at least, relationships, uh, results, and honesty. And Youssef mentioned uh, in the context of elected officials, these transactional relationships, uh, organizations can be transactional as well. Um, they, they, they aren't, those transactional relationships are not sustainable or reliable. And I, I think it's crucial 
uh, for there to be uh, a connection established that does not involve an initial ask or an initial need uh, the first time you're reaching out to smaller community groups, to activists. Um, let there be a relatable human side to an organization and just be building rapport. Um, and so those genuine relationship building and establishing rapport, establishing credibility and showing that human side of the organization, I think those are key to establishing a, re uh, a relationship. And then on the, re the results piece, I, I think we should need to just be explicit about what lane we're good at, whether it is our legal prowess or um, our ability to analyze policy or our lobbying capabilities or our huge platform. Uh, from so many of those general meetings that I've had, they've tend to evolve into uh, outreach from those organizations, from, from those individuals to say, we have this thing at the community oversight board that we would love for you to weigh in on based off of the conversation that we had. And so those are inroads and those are uh, beginnings of trust being established. And then the last piece I think is, is this, letting folks know that we do occupy a lot of space, letting folks know that we can take a step back, letting folks know that we don't have to be in the lead if we want to be in partnership uh, and in a relationship with community activists, community groups. We're perfectly fine with that. And if you're not OK with it, then maybe you, you, you're probably going to continue to have a trust problem um, with some of the organizations that you tend that you desire to be in partnership with. And then where you started the question at is larger organizations not being as nimble. It's true. This work that we do is hard enough. And so we need to be in relationship with community activists, community organizations, because it's gonna take all of us to achieve the type of uh, major change uh, and swift uh, policy agenda um, that we so desire and that we all worked hard, uh, work hard to accomplish every day. Uh, Brandon, because there are organizations who are doing this work before us There'll be organizations who are doing the work after us. Uh, the question is, what is our lane within it? So, Lewis, do you have anything to add to it? Wonderful, uh, Ian. And I think the only thing that I would add is people are experts in their own conditions. And the more we lean into the expertise of people in their own conditions, in their own communities, I think the more effective we can be. And I think the ACLU being a repository of expertise, a repository of experts. I think if we begin to include the community and directly impact the people and people who are most impacted by the policies that are being addressed, if their expertise is considered just as valued, I think that allows us to be nimble in places that we have uh, not been as nimble. expertise of just life and the communities that we're actually trying to impact. ACL, you can bring as many numbers as they want, but are they bringing those life experiences and really highlighting who those experiences or those policies are impacting? So letting people know this is their community. Again, they've lived there. Their families have lived there and how we're going to change that. Like Gary, why don't you uh, talk about that as well? Well, you know, and, and we talked about this, uh, yesterday or the day before uh, that, you know, I haven't had a whole lot of work with uh, larger organizations in part because uh, there's been this kind of go it their way approach or uh, there's been a concern about, you know, is this person too brash? Does this person's uh, image or perspective uh, push against our donor base, right? Uh, and the, the real deal is who's the most effective at getting the work done in these communities, right? Uh, and that's who we have to be partnering with and doing the work with, even if they cuss, right? Uh, even if they say some things that we don't always agree with, you know, what, what is needed, in my opinion, from organizations that are legacy organizations or, or large organizations is an authentic relationship building strategy uh, that, that when you step into a community that you step into, and, and as an activist, right, as an advocate, I can use for an example, uh, uh, a brother was killed by the police in Lafayette, Louisiana last year uh, named Trey Propellery. Well, I'm from Baton Rouge, which is 50 minutes away from Lafayette. Uh, when I went into Lafayette, uh, when I talked to the family, the first thing I did when I came out of that was I asked, who are the activists and leaders in this community that I need to talk to, right? 
And I went and had a conversation with the people on the ground in that community. Before I ever dropped a video, before I ever did anything to speak out, I made sure that there was some buy-in from the people on the ground there because that way it's authentic. And, and what I find is often organizations get this pushback because you haven't been willing to do the work. Right. The work of getting in there, finding out who the people are, building those relationships. And then, you know what? Playing your role, whatever it is. Sometimes it's to take the back seat, uh, as you suggested earlier, and support uh, the people on the ground. And sometimes it's to take the lead and sometimes it's to be uh, an equal partner. But you never get to that that discussion if you don't have those conversations. Know your role and play it well and embrace it. So. I think that's how we're making systemic change across the nation and especially on a local level. So what used to sound impossible is now really happening. And as we look around, there's other things such as HR 40 on the federal level, and there's a new reparations initiative popping up with approval in places like the state of Illinois, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. You look at even COVID with the previous administration, they didn't even ask states to do much. Uh, with the current president and vice president, there could be a nudge to look at something like reparations more seriously. Something that they talked about in the previous panel, but I want us to address as well. So what would it take to drive that kind of support in the states? Again, talking about local level that you live in. And Yusuf, why don't you start us off? Yeah, you know, this is this is such an important conversation. Um, and I, I'm happy that we are engaging in it. I watched the the hearing the other day about HR 40. Um, as a senior strategist for racial justice, a part of my docket includes reparations work. And it's easy, and I think it's it's easy for us to not appreciate the varied ways that black people have been systemically and structurally uh, oppressed beyond slavery, right? It's, it's important for us to think about the way that chattel enslavement, and I, I try to not use slavery because it gives the idea that like that was our natural state, that, that we, we walked up onto this continent as slaves and we were enslaved. It was something that was done onto us and it was done onto us by whom? A government. Therefore, they created a wrong that they must remedy. And that wrong didn't end with the abolition of slavery. Another campaign that we are working on in the NYCLU, which is the New York affiliate, is around the, the 13th Amendment. And really, as a part of the, the, abolish, the Abolish Slavery Now network, thinking about the ways that various states across the country are going to begin to not just think about reparations, because again, reparations is a federal bill, HR 40, but in New York State, there's also a reparations bill. New York State profited heavily from slavery. New York State help to manifest and continue slavers to be able to grow that economy. And New York State maintained that. Um, and so what, what the 13th Ford campaign does is thinks about how has the 13th Amendment been leveraged to create and manifest and maintain legalized slavery, which is what led and is continuing to lead to the mass incarceration movement that we see. And then lastly, in our affiliate, we talk about and we have a project around an interstate highway system. And you know, when we first talked about it, when I first brought it to the organization with some, with some colleagues, folks were thinking, what does a highway have to do with anything that we're doing? Except it has everything to do with what, what affects black people in Syracuse. Our hypersegregation is manifested because of the highway. People who live approximate to highways are, are more likely to have high morbidity rates or more exposed to environmental pollutants. The, building of the interstate highway system built off of urban renewal, which built off of redlining before that. And so this is not just a, a, a function that began with slavery. It's a function that continued and continues today. And it's a function of the preservation of a white supremacy racial caste system. And we have to own that in order for us to be able to be truthful about what happened, truthful about what's happening, and to begin to reconcile the harm that is still inflicted upon black people today. And it's not just a Southern issue because it's so easy for us to say that. It was just the South problem. My mother's from Maryland and she used to say, when she came to New York in the 60s, she was born in the 40s. When she came to New York in the 60s, it was very clear to her what racism was. Ever more clear to her than it was whenever she visited her family in the South. Because at least the South, you knew, quote unquote, your place. In the North, it was, it was covert and it was vicious, and it has been covert, vicious, and highly sophisticated. 
And so I think it's really important for us to recognize that HR 40 has to get through. We have to make sure that every state legislature also, because every state has been involved in this, thinks about and studies what happened during slavery, after slavery, and until today. And I think that's the work that we need to be really seriously engaged around. I really like how you uh, manifested all of that and speaking truth to power when it comes to enslavement altogether. You enslaved a group of innocent people and it wasn't done just by private businesses. It was done by the government and the government needs to recognize it now and needs to correct it. And it doesn't matter about the price of it because it was their problem that they started themselves. Uh, does anybody else want to jump in the conversation about reparations? Absolutely. If I can hop in right quick. I'm from Austin. I'm from Austin, Texas. And in Texas, as others have said, you know, slavery is often seen as a very pervasive thing. But once I moved to Jersey, I moved to Hudson County. Hudson County was one of the largest slave holding counties in New Jersey. And What's important for us when we're talking about H.R. 40 in re relation to slavery, if we're not talking about clemency, if we're not talking about CJ issues, if we're not talking about sentencing reform, if we're not talking about those being reparable harms that have been done to the Black community over the last 400 years, then H.R. 40 is us trying to wag the dog too late. We have to begin to pressure what they can do right now, what can be done right now is 25,000 people can be released uh, due to clemency by the stroke of a pen with categories that are not asking them to do anything other than uh, mercy and compassion. If we think about slavery through the lens of being the impetus of this law enforcement economic model that depends on black bodies to continue to profit from it, then we have to look at the very inception that not only is slavery where it began, but policing didn't start until they outlawed slavery, right? And then the more hyper-policing we have gotten as a result of us needing to put more black bodies in cages to meet this bottom line, then we have to address the economic model as well. Right? If we're going to repair, we need to look in the future and realize that this law enforcement based economic model that we're currently operating in is only going to perpetuate the um, consequences and the collateral uh, brutality that slavery has continued to levy on black folks over the last 400 years. Good. And you know what? Why don't we jump into the next question, which deals the pipeline for uh, ordinary people. How do we continue to create a space for these people uh, that don't have the same privilege or exposure to not only participate in our government, uh, but to grow and lead when it comes to political influence? Uh, I know at the ACLU, we typically have the resources to do these type of things, the background to do these type of things. How do we continue to build and bring others in there uh, to really make changes in their community and influence their own local government? Lewis, you stopped. Why don't we pick back up with you? Thank you. Um, Sister Crystal Cooper spoke to it earlier when she said that directly impacted people shifted to political landscape in Georgia. I think the more um, emphasizing something I said earlier that people are experts in their own conditions the more we lean on folks who are directly impacted by that particular issue, I think that defines the pipeline. You know, for me, what brought me into politics was the Fair Chance Hiring Ordinance. I had spent 12 years on parole, not being able to find employment. So when there came a chance to enact the Fair Chance Hiring Ordinance, I was immediately activated. Well, when you see cases where folks our need to run for office is usually in communities that are most impacted by poverty. It's usually communities that are most impacted by tax rates that are pushing people out. It's usually communities that are suffering from environmental justice type issues where our communities are, 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 are dumping sites for, um, you know, all sorts of, of noxious and, and deleterious uh, type of waste. But, Regardless, 
the pipeline begins with the people who are most directly impacted by those issues. Uh, you know, the more we encourage people who are formerly incarcerated to run for office, the closer we get to solving criminal justice problems. The more we uh, uh, insist that people, uh, black women run for office, the closer we are to dealing with the gender e inequality issues. Right, so the folks that look like the issues we are trying to solve gives people someone to vote for to solve that issue. Luz, I want to take one privilege of saying that is the ninth time someone has mentioned Georgia, and it warms my heart because there has been a lot of work that's been done in Georgia, and a lot of it has to deal with exactly what you just said. A lot of these groups and individuals have always wanted change, but they never had the resources or they never had the uh, clout or the know with all to do it. And finally, when they actually came, a change happened. And we're continuously changing. Gary, do you have any instances or thoughts on the subject? You know, I, I thought uh, what Lewis said was absolutely uh, spot on. For me, you know, we know what it looks like. Uh, to elect or appoint a bunch of people with PhDs and Ivy League degrees. Uh, and there's no shot at folks who've gone and uh, got uh, some of the best educations in uh, the country. Uh, but the question becomes, who built this inequitable system, right? Uh, who's responsible for what we see? And if that is uh, how we got here, why then would we continue to go in that direction uh, with the leaders of the future? You know, if you've never been evicted, how do you know housing, right? How do you know uh, the issues that poor people fe uh, face? If you've never uh, struggled uh, with addiction, how do you know the needs uh, of a community uh, that's dealing with addiction all over their community? Uh, if you don't have anybody in your circle uh, that's had mental health challenges, how do you then address the issues of mental health in communities where, uh, like Louisiana, for instance, you know, I have a brother who uh, ment has mental health challenges, and we've had uh, a tremendously negative impact as a family as a result of policies by Republicans uh, to strip away health care services uh, in our state, right? But I, I guarantee you the people making the decisions are not close to the issues. And as a result, you don't care. You don't step into it with the same tenacity or the same uh, perspective and the same courage when you talk about the issue. Uh, people who sit on school boards, right, who don't have public children in public schools, you know, like, like how then do you make a decision about the education of the children there when your children don't even attend the public schools in your community? Uh, or you're not a product of public education when you have no connectivity to the public school system. You, you have to have people, you know, I talk about subject matter experts all the time uh, because poor folks are subject matter experts in being poor, not wealthy people, you know, and wealthy people can always say, well, this is how you pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You had bootstraps, <laughs> you know, you had boots. There are people walking around barefoot on the rocks uh, of life in this community and in this country. And, and we are telling those people, you know, oh, you can make it too. Listen to what the people in Texas are saying right now uh, to, the, to the residents of Texas that they'd rather uh, a, a system that's not connected to the federal power grid uh, because uh, they, they want Texas to be independent. I bet they want some heat. <laughs> I bet they want to make sure that they have some hot water in their house right now. They don't care about the politics of profit. What people care about is, is their government working for them? Uh, and what we found is too often the government isn't working for the people because the government is, because we the people have elected people to lead us who are not from the same condition as us. A man with gold toilets can't tell us nothing about our plumbing. Hey, it's Speaking every and not speaking, you're preaching, brother. Uh, and you're preaching about the life experiences that you've gone through, that others have gone through, and especially highlighting those things. Uh, Brandon, I'm going to pivot to you because I wanted you to talk about your life experiences and really think about the winding road that has led you to where you are right now. Uh, what do you say to other aspiring Black activists, strategists, campaigners? any and everybody that wants to get into this type of uh, job or lobbying? Good question. I, I have to acknowledge that like my road is one of privilege in the sense that 
I was able to pursue opportunities um, that others would be limited in. I, I didn't have children. I didn't have a family. I mean, so by the time I was 25, I probably had worked in 10 different states um, from organizing roles to deputy director roles of U.S. senators and political director roles of aspiring governors. And it's just not a replicable path. Like I would not do it again. Um, it's tiring and it's not accessible uh, for people that, um, you know, have connections and ties to what's going on at home. Uh, to just go skipping the country doing um, electoral politics. Now, and, and that was my background. That's what got me to the place to where I was able to transition into the role of um, mobilizing union members and lobbying state legislatures throughout the country for uh, working people's issues, and then transitioning into uh, advocacy in the civil liberties, civil rights space. And and so what I say is this, um, the connections that I established, the political world was very small uh, for, for me. You, you constantly knew different people that were engaging uh, or a part of different campaigns in different states. Um, and so the, the connections and the reputation were certainly important to my, uh, to, to where I'm at today. But what I, what I say, is probably more important than trying to identify um, places uh, that can be replicated that involve my story. It's kind of the responsibility and the owner that are on this call, uh, especially if you work at the ACLU um, and are in a position to diversify um, your office in diversity of um, race and diversity of experience and diversity of education don't we need to seriously question um the the qualifications we're putting on we need to seriously question um the the importance of having five years work experience at jd and um and the ability to to, uh, to move to a certain city uh I think there's a lot of responsibility on the folks uh, who are listening to this call today to figure out if some if someone who is applying is so overly qualified for this role, why do they need to come work here? Because there are individuals with as much talent, with as much drive, with as much ability to learn on the job, if you are a suitable place for individuals to come in and work. And so I, you know, my path is one thing, but the ACLU has an incredible opportunity. Organizations across the country have an incredible opportunity to make a new home for aspiring black activists, aspiring black strategists, aspiring black lobbyists. Make sure your own house is in order to welcome those people in and stop having restrictions or qualifications that are so uh, unattainable for individuals that aren't as fortunate um, uh, as people like myself to go gobble up all this experience um, to one day be positioned um, to, to work as the policy director for the ACLU of Tennessee. We just need to redefine and, and look again at who we're welcoming into our spheres. I think this is a very important question, so I want to hear from all the brothers. Yusa, could you talk about your road? Yeah, you know, Brandon really raised, and it's funny because I just, I was speaking with my oldest brother today. <clears throat> we have a phrase in, in, in the Black community, you know, <laughs> this ain't new to us, this is true to us, right? And, and, and I, think it, I think it's really important for us to be recognizing that many of us had a lot of privilege to get to where we are, and, 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 and in the continuation of, of Brandon, um, I always acknowledge the fact that being from the Bronx, um, a community that was experiencing high levels of violence, um, excessive police, ex you know, uses of force and police terror, um, post 9-11 as an African-American and Muslim, um, but being fortunate to be able to go to suburban middle schools and high schools and go to a private white institution gave me a lot of privilege and opportunity. And I often reckon about this. When I, when I, before I came to the NYCLU, I worked at the UN as, as, a, as an advisor to an ambassador. And I left because honestly, the suicide of Khalif Browder affected me viscerally. Because, but not for those privileges, Khalif Browder being from the Bronx could have been me, but Khalif was my nephew. Khalif was my brother who spent 22 years behind bars from the age of 16 years old in solitary confinement. 
You know, I was able to go to suburban schools, but my mother had to lie to get me to places in order for me to be able to, that should not be the reality in this country. It should not be the reality that my zip code would determine my educational opportunities. And for many of us, we've been shielded from those things and been fortunate. And so I never forgot about the need to make sure to engage and, and not just show up because it's, it's the nice passe thing to do, not because it's cool, because I want to be a part of a clique, but how can I truly progress as a person if I'm not thinking about my own community, the folks who look like me? I, I cannot imagine the train moving without us on it. And so I just, I, I, think, it's, I think it's really, for me, important that we, we not just talk rhetorically um, about centering directly impacted people, actually really doing it. You know, we, we, we went the last several years talking about trust black women, trust black women, until they say defund the police, right? At, like, uh, until people say defund the police, oh, well, no, we can't do that. No, if that's what people are calling for, then that's what we ought to be doing. And as a powerful institution, we have an obligation to use our power to uplift those voices. It's not a, a talking point. It's not a tagline. It's a policy demand. You know, when people said end slavery, it wasn't popular to do. There were plenty of people. We fought a civil war over not letting that thing happen. And so when we, when we, when we, when we allow ourselves to, to allow people's fragility and uncomfortability dictate versus people who have not just intimate knowledge because they experienced those realities, they, they lived those realities, they're the experts on those issues. If we don't actually give them the capacity and the ability and leverage our power, then what are we doing this for? What does the constitution exist to do? What are we fighting for as an organization? And I think it's, it's really essential that as we consider the role that we have to play as an organization, as a part of a network of organizations around the country, that we really uplift those voices and not just you know, bring them in for, for a grant and then push them out when the grant is over, but truly bring them in. And lastly, because you know, the, the brother you know, Gary mentioned about PhDs. I don't have a PhD. I'm close to it. Um, but, but, but I have a brother who is pursuing a PhD. Um, and, and the irony about, about um, and I agree with everything you said, by the way, I'm not, I'm not negating that. But the irony about the comment about the bootstrap, my brother writes in his, in his dissertation that the irony about pull yourself up from the bootstrap, it was actually a joke. That's the history of that phrase. It's a joke. It's a joke because it's not physically possible for you to pull yourself up by your bootstrap. And the irony is we've switched that word around to mean how dare you not be able to hold yourself up. It's physically impossible to hold yourself up from your bootstrap, let alone I might not, ha might not even have laces, let alone I might not even have shoes in the first place. And so we haven't interrogated these things that we've come to accept as normative as fundamentally facilitating the furtherance of, again, I'm going to continue to be explicit about what we're talking about. I'm not going to use racism because that's easy to talk about. And white supremacy, heteronormative, male Christian dominance is the way that we structure our society. And everyone who is not at that position is a refraction and continues to be systematically and structurally oppressed afterwards. And so if we don't make sure we center those folks, we're not doing the real work. The real work is what we're talking about. Uh, Lewis, you gonna jump in? So I wanna hear from all you brothers. Um, diversity in leadership, I think is a phrase that we haven't quite unpacked. And, you know, I'm not in, in possession of a GED, let alone a college degree. So if it were up to my academic achievements, I wouldn't be at the ACLU. But someone had the vision to recognize that I had run enough campaigns that I knew what I was doing as a strategist. So I think, you know, as we begin to think about us solving the problems, the way we're solving COVID is through a vaccination, which includes just a little piece of the COVID to inoculate you. Well, that same tactic, if we want to inoculate our communities from the harms of the communities, we need to be using the people that look like the ones that's harming the community as part of the solution. So the folks who look like 
the issue is usually the ones who are closest to the solutions to that issue. Brother, are you saying you want to vaccinate America in that way? I mean, that's I love the idea. Let's do I it. Want to vaccinate, I want vaccinate to vaccinate America. Mass incarceration with compassion. I want to use decarceration as a way to fix the prison population. I want to use directly impacted leadership as a way to not only um, um, guide this ship, but to give this ship some purpose so we don't run out of fuel. Is, right, is you might right? just actually, <laughs> you might actually just cure <laughs> this godforsaken country doing things like that. No, oh, that's it. This, those are the type of things and mentality that really makes changes, especially in an institutional sense. Because what you're doing, you're fighting the institution uh, altogether with the people who are mostly impacted. So yeah, let's inoculate America, brother. That's I'm, I'm glad that you brought up, that up to the forefront. Gary, I'm coming back to you, man. Man, why you let me go after Lewis just said that? I know, that? man, because I'm not going to talk after him. I didn't want to go after that. Uh, right. You know, like, like oof, that was good, man. That was good. Uh, but, but true, you know. Uh, and I can relate. You know, I'm a high school graduate. I'm not supposed to be in this position. Uh, I didn't spend a day in college. Uh, started a business with some of my friends a few years ago and never saw advocacy or activism uh, as something that I was going to do. I was just a young black man trying to be in business and make money. Uh, and when I got out in my community, I realized that, you know, the businesses here weren't interested in spending with young black entrepreneurs, right? Uh, which opened up another door for me to say, well, what, what is it to that? Um, and, and I've always been kind of this opinionated, brash person who just said what needed to be said, even if nobody wanted to hear it. Uh, I was getting kicked out of elementary school because I was telling teachers that uh, uh, they were wrong when I was a kid and the same thing in high school. Um, and, and what I know is for every one of us that there's a, uh, what I believe a God-given purpose uh, for us to fulfill on this earth. And the question is uh, not how much education you have, how much experience you have, it's really how much heart do you have for people. And I think what Lewis's comment uh, touched me so much is, is because it conveyed a heart for people. Um, and, and what's clear in this country is, you know, we can talk about under God, we trust and all of that stuff like that. This ain't no Christian nation. This ain't no moral nation. A nation that in its founding uh, allowed black folks to be labeled three-fifths a person, didn't allow their women and children, women and daughters uh, to be a part of the voting process. This ain't no moral nation. This nation from its inception has been wicked. The question is, is our heart for people enough to right the wrongs of the past? Do we have a commitment to the people that we say we love, serve, and care about to be committed to this work? You know, um, and I think that voices like Lewis and Brandon and yours, Chris and Yousef's elevate because of a heart and a passion for people and change and progress, not because we are so gifted, not because we are so educated or we have been benefited with so many opportunities and all of those things have contributed, right? But they are more gifted people than us. They are more educated people than us, more talented people than us. But I dare you to find somebody with a bigger heart for people. And, and, and when we lead with that in mind, right? And that's why you get people closest to the issue because the closer you are to the issue, the more your heart connects to it. And it's not a policy decision. It's not a business decision. It becomes a people decision. And too often people in leadership roles are making decisions based on what's profitable, not what's good for people. And, and I don't care if I ever get another like on social media or another follow in this life, as long as my heart is right towards people, I can go to sleep at night and be at peace because I live by this. I would rather be at war with the world and at peace with myself than at peace with the world and at war with myself. I'm going to sleep good at night because I'm going to do what's in my heart for people. 
And I think that if we put people in leadership in every uh, aspect of leadership, whether you are running a nonprofit organization, whether you are uh, an executive of a company, now, yes, you need to be qualified, right? I'm not saying passion and love and, and all of that is enough by itself, right? But the rubric for success can no longer just be tied to uh, what pedigree we come from uh, because that's not what's going to change our community. And, and if you're satisfied with, you know, so many people in our country living in poverty, if you're satisfied with discrimination still existing, if you're satisfied with over-incarceration, if you're satisfied with people not having basic needs like access to food, uh, clean water, clean air, a job and housing, right? Those are basic moral tenets of any society, any, any functioning society, right? And we live by this logic that America is like the greatest place on earth. And I guarantee you there are some people in some countries that would not come here because sometimes this is a heartless nation because it sure is a godless one. And I, I think everything that you just said, Gary, I completely agree with. And I think thugs such as going off of what you just said, COVID-19 really exposed that saying America is the best nation in the world, but we were the worst when dealing with this virus altogether. And it deals with leadership, like you said before. We didn't have competent leadership altogether. And there were others who were trying to push forth leaders who had no business being there, who had absolutely no stake in the community and absolutely no way of finding out a real path to fix the problems that we were facing. So like you were saying, like Lewis is saying, Yusuf was saying, Brandon was saying, the people who are closest to the problem who are being impacted are also the ones who need to be fixing the problem as well. And it's our job to put that and give them the resources to do it. So all of you brothers are such dynamic people with an incredible path that has brought you here today. And as we talk about building power and impact with so many perspectives, how do we continue to remain inclusive and intersectional as we work? So specifically, as formerly and currently incarcerated Black folks, Black parents, Black young people, Black disabled folks, Black elders, Black trans and queer folks, all Black people, all together, we need to figure out how we can actually make a difference. So Gary, uh, why don't I go right back to you about that? I think, I think, you know, when we talk about sitting at these tables, so often we walk in the room and we never ask, why does the room look like this, right? I've been to tables before, uh, and I asked uh, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine once, uh, why are you so comfortable at tables where no other black folks are? Why, why are you all right in that room? And, and if you are a white person, right, in leadership, and you sit in a room and you're making decisions about helping black folks and ain't no black people at the table. If you're talking about uh, queer and trans folks and there are no queer and trans folks in the room. If you're talking about marginalized people or formerly incarcerated people and none of them are in the room, are you fit to even make a decision? And, and if you're not gut checking yourself about this, then, then it's never going to work. I have to ask myself, right, in, in the roles and the work that I have done consistently, right? If I say I'm advocating for black women, how many black women are at the table when I walk in the room? When I hire how many black women am I hiring in the process of the work that I'm doing, right? And I have to be intentional about that work because I'm intentional about seeing the representation of all of our people. Uh, I ask myself, how many non-heterosexual people are a part of the work that we're doing, right? Because it is important to make sure that as we do the work that we do, that we navigate from a place of real representation. And, and, and don't you be the cook that's setting the menu to cook other people. Because the, the, the logic or the quote has always said that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And, the, and another thing, some of us need to be willing to walk away and build our own tables. We, we want to be accepted so much. We want to be a part of things so much that we are unwilling to build. Um, and so I have been committed in my own right uh, to just sometimes go it alone, right? Uh, and the people who are serious about this work, they bring themselves to the table and, and we get about the work and the business. What I've learned through my advocacy is you will find out who's committed by continuing to show up. 
If you ever want to know who in the community is about that work, just keep showing up and you will see the same faces on a regular basis and that will become your tribe. And, 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 and that tribe is how we go out and make the change happen in our communities. Uh, no one person can do it alone, but you can venture out by yourself. Sometimes we have to start alone and then all of the pieces come, come together uh, as we go on this journey. But you got to be willing to stand out uh, sometimes and speak up at those tables. And if people aren't willing to, to bring that equity and inclusion to those tables, be willing to get up from the table. While we're here, uh, thank you for those comments, friend. Gary, um, I want to take a question from the audience. So we're looking at supporting young black and brown boys from an early age. What changes need to happen? And I'm going to have this open to everyone. Who wants to speak I'll, I'll up? Jump, I'll jump in real quick. You know, I think um, if, if we don't recognize the, the varied ways that um, structures impact us and there are ways that structures impact black boys but there are also specific ways that structures impact black girls if we don't think about how do we provide the types of supports and mechanisms that all of the black people who are experiencing oppression experience eventually it will affect all of us right and and, and you know in in the in the in the in the movements around you know abolition of the carceral state, you know when I, when I when I think about folks like Dorsey Nunn, right, and they talk about in the, in the prison industrial system, all of us should be free or none of us, um, so that way you don't compromise on these values and principles. It, it, we we have to think about the ways that these structures impact Black boys, and and we have to focus on that and and identify the way that they affect them. But we have to also think about how those things structurally impact all of black people. Um, and, and if we're not doing that, then, then we're not really fully accepting the reality of the way that the structures will play us apart from one another and impact our lives in devastating ways. So I think as we think about how to help black boys, we have to be explicit about thinking about how that works in tandem with, with, other, with other black communities that are also oppressed. A question from the audience. Uh, especially for those of you who are working within institutions, you know, how do you balance the need for centering impacted people with the organizational need for wins in the courts and on the federal level, such as Congress? Get form and culture to people that know how to win. Like, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's not a, I'm sorry. And I, and I don't mean to jump in like that. Um, no, go ahead. But like, the wins have come as the result of centering people who are most directly impacted. There was no way for us to win equal rights for marriage if it didn't involve centering the directly impacted people. There is no way for us to win uh, uh, reproductive rights wins if we don't have women at the front of that. So I think the less we lean on the expertise of lived experience, I think that constricts our chance of winning. And so I think the balance has to be struck by folks with the most stepping back so that folks with the least can step forward. Anybody else want to jump in? Anybody else? Uh, I, I mean, just I think what Lewis I mean, said is absolutely right. Uh, oh. Right. I, I think what Lewis said is absolutely right. Sometimes we act like, you know, uh, because somebody's from a certain background, that they they're not qualified uh, to be a part of this conversation. I don't I don't think uh, these conversations move anywhere without the people most impacted. And often you see that things get stale when elected officials or people who are trying to move these things forward don't have an authentic narrative to tell. There's like literally the narrative is so important to even uh, every part of litigation, right? If there's not a story, what are you fighting for, right? If, if there's no human connection, no human experience, you know, you're just talking. And then it's not personal. And if there's not a personal connection, people can just, it's business as usual, 
right? And, and you have to make you have to make these decisions. Some of these decisions are not just um, you know X's and O's. They are literally human experiences and people's humanity on the line. And if we're not involving them in the process, then it's not genuine and it's not authentic. And, and as a result, it's ineffective. Gentlemen, look, we are coming close to time. So I want to make sure that everybody who's on this call, who's looking right now, can know about the dynamic work that you're doing. So why don't you tell us what's on your plate these days, especially to build a better black future? Uh, Brandon, why don't we go to you first? Sure. Um, look, I we like every state thing is um, have a little session. Um, we make sure that we expand, um, not just in focus on our state work, but our, our localized work. But, you know, one thing I, I have to kind of preface and say that I acknowledge, I think we all acknowledge that racial justice and black political power is not synonymous to criminal justice reform. It's sometimes, at times, um, the things that are heavy, heaviest on our legislative docket, uh, the things that can make true impact. Um, and so that's what uh, our focus is consistently. Um, at the legislature this year, correcting um, our broken policing system, um, trying to uh, ensure there's a pathway to decarcerate, ensuring that young people uh, charged as adults aren't spending 51 years um, in prison uh, until they're eligible for parole, um, ensuring that black and brown communities aren't overly surveilled. Um, these are, you know, the consistent themes uh, of our work um, and also ensuring that we're centering the criminalization of poverty. So, you know, those are those are the uh, central tenets and central themes of our legislative work this year. We are partnering with those who have more experience, have more knowledge and expertise in these issue areas uh, than I do, uh, but it's, it's, it's centered um, and, 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 and rooted in uh, the advancement and trying to rid uh, the oppression of uh, systemic racism um, in our state, uh, as, especially as it pertains to uh, our criminal legal system. Yusuf, what about you? Yeah, I mean, we have a really ambitious agenda and it's, it's, in, it's important for us to be ambitious because the problems are so robustly absurd that they're askew from what should be acceptable. So we're doing things like trying to change New York State's constitution to make sure that New York State is not a state that, that allows and affords people to engage in the... the, the and we, when we talk about the prison industrial complex, we often talk about in New York State, downstate black people being criminalized and then funneled upstate to fuel for, for some rural communities, job opportunities. But we very rarely talk about, when we think about the prison industrial complex, the ways that we manufacture goods and services from prison labor that are in all of our schools. Companies like Corecraft that are able to, you know, have a furniture line called the Attica Collection, which is based off of Attica Prison. Right, the absurdity of that, right? You know, and, and not just the, the 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 way that there's you know products and services outside of prisons that are being in schools and, and state government offices and police departments, but also explicitly the prisons being run, the people who work in prisons. And during COVID, what we saw is people having prisoners having to make and manufacture, you know, hand sanitizer. So that everybody could have that because of supply chain challenges, but not be able to use it themselves, right? We're thinking about smart cities and the way that surveillance technologies in this era of the Internet of Things and this fourth industrial revolution have explicit particular implications on black and brown communities who are organizing and, and the threat and concerns of being surveilled. And in this mass incarceration, police brutality terror moment where we saw the horrific death of George Floyd, but also in, in Rochester, New York, the death of Daniel Prude, a person who was experiencing a mental health crisis and his family calling for assistance, which resulted in his death from law enforcement's activity and action, right? That we have to not 
continue to funnel money into law enforcement, but to remove it out of law enforcement, to reduce the size, scope, power of law enforcement, to reduce this warrior cop mentality, this idea that officers are engaged in war on terror or war on crime or war on drugs, and our communities are the occupied forces that they have to wage this war against. That in fact, the best things that we should be doing is giving money to folks in our communities so that they can be the ones to help heal the harm that have been inflicted upon us. Our portfolio is robust, but it always exists because of people power. And but not for the communities who are directly impacted, we wouldn't have passed last year the repeal of 50A. So I wanna make sure that the people who are watching this, not who are just a part of the ACLU family, but who are watching this who may not be as deeply involved in our work to know, there has been nothing in this country's history that has changed without people expecting that their elected officials and demanding that change happen. Showing up in the streets, showing up at the ballot, showing up every day, day in and day out, and make sure that it happens. And that collective action is what we are trying to build out in our organization and supporting those who have been doing that work long before us. Lewis, I'm jumping it over to you. 25,000 people released through federal clemency has been, you know, the most recent bucket of work. But, you know, historically, it's just been making sure that we restrict the ways people are incarcerated, um, you know, for not breaking laws in terms of parole and probation, uh, technical violations, um, making sure that we are activating the incarcerated vote. You know, folks who are in jail, 90% of them have not been found guilty. And so that's a complete voting block that we have overlooked. You know, if we're looking to coalesce the black vote, we don't have to look any further than a criminal justice impacted community. We don't have to look any further than their loved ones if we want to coalesce the black vote. So for me, it has been making sure that we are bold in our ask, but also, you know, I'm, I've often said, if we're gonna say no to something, we have to be saying yes to something. And before we say no to something, we have to have crafted what that yes looks like. And so um, I think that means community safety has to be, before we begin to even wrestle with police defunding, we have to be thinking about how can we make people better neighbors, right? Because better, uh, good neighboring outpaces bad policing any day. So that's kind of where my focus has been or is going to be is trying to figure out ways for us to get to that 50% decarceration rate while employing the means of compassion and mercy. Thank you, Lewis and Gary, we're gonna wrap up with you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion and connecting with uh, all of you. Uh, this has been uh, a healthy dialogue. Uh, I'm currently working on a whole bunch of stuff, some things uh, that are uh, able to talk about and some things we're not. Uh, but the most important thing I'm working on is helping people uh, and helping tell stories of people uh, that are impacted by the injustices that happen in this country. I live in a state that ranks 50 in the nation. Uh, we rank 50 in opportunity, 50 in environmental quality, 45 in healthcare, 47 in education. Uh, if it's bad, we're at the top. If it's good, we're at the bottom. Um, and I'm committed to this place uh, because I love it. Uh, I'm from it. I believe in the philosophy, grow where you plant it. Um, and I believe that uh, this old deep south, uh, Louisiana hot mess that we got can be better than it is, but we got to tell the truth about what it is uh, to make it better. Um, and so telling the stories of people like uh, Trayford Pellerin and Ronald Green, uh, both killed by the police here in Louisiana, uh, helping their families get justice, uh, working with uh, city leaders here. We've helped to elect uh, some great people to the city council here in Baton Rouge in the last election, election cycle. Uh, Going to be working on uh, our school board elections next year. Uh, Y'all know about Connie. Uh, we won't send her home because uh, she wouldn't resign. Uh, but we want to make sure that uh, we are actively engaged in putting the right type of people in leadership 
um, and with this expanded platform uh, to do as much as we can to do good in our community while the day is still uh, here. And so uh, just committed to people and change, man. And, and how do we tell those stories? Because I think one of our most powerful gifts um, is the ability to share uh, information with each other. Um, and how we tell these stories is important uh, because I think it, it humanizes uh, what so many people make such a distant thing, right? Uh, they make criminal justice reform a distant thing. They make uh, housing justice a distant thing or uh, healthcare access a distant thing. Uh, but when we tell that story better, uh, we can make it a personal thing. And, and I think when it becomes personal, it's easier for us to find solutions to the problems. Guys, that's brothers. Brothers, thank you so much uh, for saying all of this and contributing to this dialogue. I know this is not going to be the last time that we talk, but I appreciate your time and everything else that we've done. That is all the time that we have for today. Let's continue to fight. Thanks, y'all.